Heavenly Father, again, we want to thank you and we want to praise you for this Sunday morning to be able to worship, to be able to uh, hear your word, to speak your word. I pray, Lord, that you would, again, convict us of the ways in which we have um, not been acknowledging you in the way that we consume media. And I pray, Lord, instead that you would help us to be reflective, uh, challenge us during this time, uh, and again, remind us of what we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, again, the series has this particular series in the summer. We've been starting with Romans 12, 1 through 2. I'm going to read it again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so the idea is, again, every week we've been saying, this is our jumping off point, right? We want to live for God. We want our bodies to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. But the way that's going to happen is if we are transformed by the renewal of our mind. But there's a phrase before that in verse 2 that says, do not be conformed to this world. So last week we said, what does that look like? Right? What, what is Paul talking about when he talks about the world? Okay? Uh, the Apostle John has an explanation. Right? He says in 1 John 2, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So from this passage, and we talked about this more in length last week, the idea is you can understand that the world, the definition that the uh, that the Bible is giving for the world is everything that's not from God, okay? And so just a, a tangible way to understand this is by looking at the result of following the things of the world, right? So Galatians 5 says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So anything that causes you to go in this direction, to, to result in these sins, that's the stuff that's going to be from the world that is not going to be from God, right? But look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Gentleness is self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. The things that are from God are going to produce this fruit of the Spirit in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, etc. Right? So that would be the difference. So the things of this world are going to produce the list of sins that we just read before, and the things from the Father are going to produce the things of the fruit of the Spirit. Right? So um, uh, John Piper makes a comment on this idea, okay? This idea that, like, wait, I have these desires. There's things that I want. Is everything that I want bad, right? So John Piper says this, but someone will ask, should I not desire dinner? Should I not desire a job? Should I not desire a spouse? Should I not desire the child in my womb? Should I not desire a healthy body or a good night's rest or the morning sun or a good book or an evening with friends? And the answer is no, unless it is a desire for God. Do you desire dinner because you desire God? Do you want a job because in it you will discover God and love God? Do you long for a spouse because you are hungry for God and hope to see him and love him in your partner? Do you desire the child and the healthy body and the good night's rest and the morning sun and a great book and evening with friends for God's sake? Do you have an eye for God in everything you desire? So in other words, just kind of summarizing all of this stuff up, the idea is this. Inside of us is a sinful nature. We desire sin. We want sin. We are wicked and evil, right? That's me. That's what lives inside of me. And when I see things outside of me, right, that appeal to those evil, wicked desires, the result is going to be that I'm going to do those things, right? And so what John Piper is basically saying, and what these verses that we've been reading are basically saying is, because my desires are crooked, when I see things right, that are depraved, I will chase after those things and then do those things. And in fact, because my desires are crooked, almost everything that I do is going to be crooked. But if my desires are for God, then everything that I do is in order, okay? And so because of that, we need to talk about our media because the way you consume media matters, okay? And we're going to be talking, and we've been talking about four different categories. Audio media, video media, interactive media, and social media, okay? 
And the reason why we're talking about these four categories is because the medium is the message. How you communicate something is just as important as what is communicated, right? So you've heard the phrase, a picture is a thousand words. Well, that idea is that even though it's a photograph, it conveys ideas and thoughts that books can convey, right? That a single piece of artwork can convey a volume's worth of words, right? And so we talked about mainly just two last week. We focused on audio and video media. We focused on audio media, specifically music, right? We said music is one of the most powerful methods of teaching that as teachers we can use to teach you about topics, right? So when you wanted to learn the alphabet, when your teacher wanted to teach you the alphabet, you guys learned the alphabet song, right? Um, so when you put melody and lyric together, it helps us to memorize messages from the culture, right? So what the culture wants to communicate to you is going to come out in the culture's music, right? And you're going to memorize those words and those phrases, and then those eventually become a part of who you are. It becomes a part of your belief system. It becomes a part of your world view, right? Um, and when we talked about video, we talked about <coughs> um, how video is how our culture tells stories, um, and stories is where we get our values from. So last week I showed a couple clips from some commercials. Uh, the commercials were less than a minute each, and yet they were very effective in telling us a little story and communicating a bit of value and pulling our emotions to agree with those values. Right? So our culture uses video to effectively tell stories, and that's where we get our values from. Okay? Um, and so uh, one of the slides that I showed last week was these three shows because this is the stuff that's most popular in our culture now, right? These are the shows that are the fastest watched, that are the most watched, that are the most popular, the most downloaded, the most binge watched, right? Now here's the thing. Last week, after the message was done, a bunch of people came up to me and basically essentially told me in a nutshell, like, oh, so the main point, uh, and, and also told their teachers that, oh, so the main point of the message is there's Secular music, and there's secular videos, and those things are bad, and so I should only listen to Christian music, and I should only watch Christian videos. That was not the point. That is never the point. Those words never flew out of my mouth. So I want to clarify something, okay, because I think you guys have a tendency to see slides like this, hear me talking about it, and go, oh, House of Cards bad, 13 Reasons Why bad, Game of Thrones bad, I should watch other stuff, okay? These are just examples of what's popular. When it comes to how Christians should be consuming video and audio content, it really has more to do with whether or not it is good for you. The truth is a Christian can watch whatever he or she wants to. In Christ, we have the freedom to watch anything we want to. The question is whether or not it's wise for us to do so. Right? That's really the key. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, and 31 say this. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Right? And combine that with Philippians 4.8, which is what we talked about uh, at the end of last week. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so the idea is, if you take these ideas and you combine it together, the question is, can a Christian watch any of these shows? And I'd argue, actually, I think you can. I think as a Christian, you can watch these things. The question is whether or not it's wise to watch these things, right? I've seen episodes from all three of these shows, right? But I have the spiritual maturity to sit there and go, this is okay, this is bad, this is good. But if you don't have the ability to do that and you watch all of your media passively, which means you just sit there without thinking and you just watch things, okay, that's not a good way to do that. See, movies, TV shows, the music I listen to, everything's been ruined for me in the sense that I can't not think in terms of worldview categories. Everything I listen to, everything I watch gets placed into buckets of worldview stuff. And they become illustrations for what we should and should not do and how we should and should not live. Everything has an agenda. Every show, every song has a message it wants to share with you, right? 
And so we as Christians need to understand first and foremost, that exists, right? And hopefully you guys were shown that yesterday, or last week, right? Last week, it was a good illustration of how messages are given out to you. So number one, you at least are awakened to this idea that there are messages there. But number two, how do we begin to filter those things out, okay? For example, House of Cards is a cynical political drama. And when I say cynical, I really mean the worst of the worst kind of cynicism. Everybody in House of Cards is wicked and evil, and they're only out for political gain and greed, and it's all about manipulation. It's a very negative view of Washington, D.C. On the flip side, a number of years ago, there was a show called The West Wing, right? That aired on national television during prime time when people were still watching TV, during the time that the show was on, like all of that stuff. It's a more positive view of the government, right? The characters are more aspirational. So the idea is you could be watching political drama, okay? One is a negative view of, of politicians. One is a more hopeful, positive view of politicians. They both deal with the same content, but you have to watch them differently, right? I can watch West Wing and understand that this is how the government should do certain things or not do certain things, or this is the kinds of people that we should raise up to these kinds of positions, right? But if I'm watching House of Cards, what I'm going to notice is that, whoa, these are the kinds of people, if we put these kinds of greedy, selfish people in power, this is what they do. They abuse that power. They do these things. They manipulate, blah, 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 and all, this, all of this stuff, right? In both instances, government matters, okay? Now, that's not the only thing that's a part of the show, right? But those are some of the things that I can take away from it. Uh, 13 Reasons Why, when this show first came out, Almost everybody unanimously, like in terms of youth, the youth pastor world, was like, youth pastors, you need to see this. Parents, you need to watch this. And you need to watch and see these things because this is what the teenagers think about their own lives, about the way uh, social media interactions work, about bullying, about sex, about all of that stuff. Their social interactions, like all those things. 13 Reasons Why puts the, all of that together in a very compelling way. It's not necessarily the most realistic thing in the world, but there are definitely elements that are a part of the show that definitely exist. And as youth pastors, we need to talk about this stuff. But if you're just, again, sitting there because your friend watched it and it's an interesting show and you're not thinking in terms of any worldview categories whatsoever, it's probably not a good reason to watch it. Same with Game of Thrones. There are good guys and there are bad guys and you can watch the shows for those kinds of elements. But with all of these things, you have to be careful, right? If you're an alcoholic, okay, it's not wise for you to go and hang out in a bar with friends because you're going to be tempted to drink. In the same way, if any of these things are going to tempt you to do wicked, evil things, then that's what you should be avoiding. If you're prone to depression and you have suicidal thoughts, the worst thing you could do is watch 13 Reasons Why, because this is a show that's going to try to justify why you should kill yourself. That's not what we want you to do. That's what makes this show so dangerous, right? Parents should probably watch it so that they may be able to understand maybe what their teenagers are going through, but you shouldn't. And yet, it was the fastest watched, fastest binge show on Netflix when it came out, which means that there are teenagers all over the country that are having suicidal thoughts that are incredibly depressed. And I'm glad a show like this exists to bring that out into the open, but if millions of teenagers are watching this and never talking to an adult about what they feel and what they're going through, that's a recipe for disaster. Does that make sense? That's why this stuff is so important. We have to learn how to consume media, right? So that said, um, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, the next two categories, right? So the first category is going to be interactive media, okay? And specifically, we're talking about video games, okay? Uh, video games are the most interactive medium in that we are literally interacting with the things that are on the screen. Uh, and the entire industry actually is heading towards virtual reality as the next phase of interactive media. Okay. Now, virtual reality is interesting. Uh, when we were on the Berkeley mission trip, one of the things that we got to do was we got to go to the Dolby Laboratory. So Dolby is the um, uh, sound system company. When you guys watch a movie, the Dolby Atmos logo comes up, and you hear the boom sound and all that stuff. That's all Dolby. And we got to go to their laboratory. We got to see some of the cutting-edge technology that they have. They showed us a TV that could almost reproduce the brightness of the sun. Like, we were watching scenes in the dark of, like, the sun bouncing off of, like, chrome on cars and on, uh, on airplanes. And literally, every time the sun bounced off, everyone was like, whoa. <laughs> or when there was, like, fire that appeared on the screen, everyone in the room was like, whoa. Like, it was crazy. It was cool to see that kind of cutting-edge technology. But one of the things Dolby's researching is 
virtual reality, right? How does virtual reality affect us? Because these technology companies are recognizing that technology does have moral implications, moral and ethical implications. Is it good for us to develop this technology, right? So when we talk about scientific breakthroughs in the human body, like cloning and stuff, everyone knows, oh wait, I, I'm not sure about this, we gotta sit and we gotta think about it. In the technology realm though, for the most part, people really haven't thought about whether these things are good or bad. But now that we've reached the point where we're now, Doing things like VR, every tech company, even though they're moving as far, fast as they can forward, they all are re doing research on whether or not this is good or, or what can be good and what are the bad parts and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And it turns out that with, when, in regards to virtual reality, one of the bad things is that our bodies don't, aren't used to and can't get used to being in a virtual environment, right? So when you're wearing a VR headset, okay, your eyes trick your brain into believing that you're in this new place, okay? But your body, the rest of your body, your hands and your feet, they know that you're in this room, basically, okay? And I remember the first time I ever tried on a VR headset, it was uh, a demo at a um, game development conference, and I was sitting down on a chair, and they put the VR goggles on me, and the simulation was a jetpack simulation. So you got to ride on a jetpack, and you got to go above the city and fly around, um, and kind of interact with the world. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to see if I could trick my body, okay? So I sat down in the chair, and in the VR world, I shot up to the highest skyscraper, as high as I could possibly go in this VR world, and then I dropped the controller. Because I wanted to see if my eyes think I'm falling, okay, would my body react in any way? And even though I'm, psychologically, I know that this is an experiment I'm gonna do, because my eyes and my brain are like, oh no, you're falling. First off, my body tensed up, and you know when you go down on a roller coaster, that feeling where your stomach is like, oh, 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 right? Like, I'm sitting in a chair, I'm not moving, but because my brain thinks I'm moving, that like, upper gut feeling starts happening. And I was like, this is fascinating, right? And then in like, I think a couple years ago, we went to Magic Mountain, and Magic Mountain has a VR roller coaster. So they do Revolution, the roller coaster, but they slap a pair of VR glasses on you. And the VR experience is timed to the roller coaster itself. Now what's interesting is, most of us on the ride, when we rode at the same time, we got the timed experience. But a couple people, the VR glasses weren't working properly. And so on the screen, they were stuck, right? So the, the, the storyline is that you're like a fighter pilot, okay? And when you're on the roller coaster and as it's going up, you get lifted out of this airplane hangar and then you fly around in, the, um, in a city and you get to blast alien spaceships. But for some people, the VR glasses broke and they weren't responding to any of the digital signals that they were supposed to respond to. So in the virtual world, they were stuck in the hangar. They never left the hangar, but the roller coaster is going. Does that make sense? And they felt sick afterwards. And it's because our body and our brain need to work in tandem together. When those things are disconnected, you feel really sick. Okay? So that's the research that's going on. People are talking about these things. There are questions of how long can you be in a, a virtual world without you know, feeling sick? You know, how, how, what kinds of experiences do you need? What kind of whatever? And it turns out that the more immersive it is, the better it is because your body and your brain need to be held together. Does that make sense? So they're trying to do as much as they can to activate all of your um, um, uh, senses, okay? And they're trying to make it so that to, to trick as much of your body as possible. So the idea is that this interactive video game stuff is going to get more and more and more and more immersive. That's just the way the industry is heading, okay? Um, and what makes video games so powerful, okay, is that they create a system of reinforcement. So basically, in a video game, you're rewarded for repeated behaviors, right? So if you're playing a sports video game, when you score a goal, you get points. That feels good, so you keep wanting to do it over and over and over again, right? If you're um, Mario and you're jumping around collecting coins, you get points, you're going to want to collect coins over and over and over again, right? If you're in an alien world and you blast aliens and you get points, you're going to want to do that over and over and over again, right? If you're in a warfare game and you shoot bad guys and they die and blood squirts all over the screen, but you get points, you're going to want to do that over and over and over again. If the point of the game is to carjack, and steal people's cars, beat up the police, and you get points for that, you're going to do that over and over and over again. Do you see the, the problem okay, that can arise? When you're rewarded for good behavior, great, but when you're rewarded for negative behavior, that's not so good for the person that's playing the game. Okay? And with video games, you're not watching stories unfold, unlike 
just video media, but you're actively participating in them. So you're not just being told a story, you are a part of that story, you're contributing to that story. So now there's even more of an um, emotional connection. Okay? Um, and that's why certain video games now, they're making really uh, story-driven video games. And they're becoming incredibly popular because they get you to feel stuff that sometimes even video media can't do because, again, you're a part of what's going on. Right? Um, and so uh, one of the big things that people always talk about when it comes to video games is whether or not violent video games affect us. Okay? So here's the deal. Um, scientific studies have shown that a direct correlation between video vi violent video games and violent behavior do not exist. Okay? Meaning just because you play a violent video game doesn't mean that you're going to go out and do violent things. But there is a correspondence. What it means is if you already show okay, violent behavior, when you play a violent video game, you show more violent behavior, okay? And that's, in fact, completely a biblical idea of how sin works. When you have an inclination towards sin, and there's an outside temptation that says it's okay to do that sin, then what will happen? You will do more of that sin, okay? And that's essentially what we're talking about when we talk about all the different media, right? Music, when you see that... <clears throat> The messages from culture are all about sex, and that's the thing that it's driving you towards, and that's what you desire, that's what you're going to go out and do if that's what's rolling in your head and your mind all the time. When video, when video media itself tells you that rebelling against your parents is normal, your parents are dumb, you have an evil inclination already to rebel against your parents, so you're going to go and you're going to do those things over and over and over again. The same thing with violent video games, right? And so, because the video game industry knows this, they developed what's called an ERSB rating system, so the Entertainment Software Rating Board, okay? And this is what it looks like. You've seen these letters on the video game boxes and like your local GameStop or whatever, digitally, they have these uh, warning labels as well. Um, out of the top 10 video games sold last year, six of them were rated M and four of them were rated E. So basically, that means that really E and M are the only ones that we need to pay attention to. Those are the only ones that matter, okay? And if you look at a game that's rated E versus a game that's rated M, you see kind of the differences, right? E takes place in a fantasy world, right? Nothing in the actual world looks like this. If you go to an island, it does not look like this. People don't look like this. If you saw a man that looked like Mario, this Mario walking around the streets, you'd be like, oh my gosh, he has a crazy genetic disease. We need to get him help, okay? Um, and he was jumping around eating mushrooms and stuff. You, you'd be scared of him. You would not want to be his friend, okay? Uh, but the idea is, again, this is all fantasy. We know it's fantasy. It doesn't reflect the real world. But on the M side, it's created to look just like the real world, right? It's reinforcing stuff in the real world. And it's allowing you to fantasize behavior, but in the actual environment. Whereas on the E side, you see that it's um, actual behavior, fantastical behavior, and fantastical world. On the M side, it's fantastical behavior, but very much grounded in the real world. That's really going to be the difference between the E games and the M games. Okay. Um, <clears throat> If you read the description for the e-games, it says this. Content is generally suitable for all ages, may contain minimal cartoon, fantasy, or mild violence, and or infrequent use of mild language. Okay? Uh, that just made me laugh a little bit, because I'm like, does Mario curse in his games, like infrequently or something? <laughs> um, M, okay, this is the description for M. Content is generally suitable for ages 17 and up, may contain intense violence, blood and gore, sexual content, and or strong language. Um, the thing that I would want to question about this is, why is this appropriate for 17 and up? Like, why 17? Why is it that a 16-year-old can't handle intense violence, blood and gore, sexual content, and or strong language, but all of a sudden you hit 17, and all of a sudden intense language, blood and gore, sexual content, and strong language is perfectly fine. Um, I think that says a little bit about our culture and sort of where we are. Now, you do have to arbitrarily draw a line somewhere, but I wonder why 17, right? Um, especially d when you're dealing with the themes that are in a lot of these books, or a lot of these, a lot of these games. Um, and so really, the questions that we have to ask are, again, right, going back to uh, 1 Corinthians, going back to Philippians, the question is, when I'm choosing what game to play, is it wise for me to be playing these games? Okay. Now, there's a way, again, to be redemptive about the way that we do things. Right? 
I think that there are certain M games that are perfectly fine for Christians to play because they actually um, help the people that are playing to understand good guys versus bad guys, to understand courage, to understand heroism. There's a video that's going around on Facebook about these um, soldiers who are basically rescuing um, Syrian girls, okay, in the middle of crossfire, right? That there's a group of American soldiers who are going around the country rescuing little girls in the middle of warfare, right? Where does a man get the confidence, okay, or the bravery and the, cur- uh, the courage to do that? I actually think certain war video games could be helpful, right? You understand that this video game is simulating reality, so that's not what reality actually looks like, but the idea is you've visualized it before. You understand what it's like to go into enemy territory. You understand what it's like to rescue somebody, right? Those are virtues that we want to build into men. In fact, if you're playing games like that and then you don't reflect that in real life, that's kind of shameful, right? But the idea is if you're brave in a video game, then you need to learn how to be brave in real life. And I think that's totally redemptive. I think that's something that... um, can be totally possible, right? You get together with your guys, you play online together, you join up as a team together, you face the bad guys, defeat the bad guys, rescue um, hostages, be men together, be courageous together, be brave together, like all of that stuff's good. But if the point of the game is to rob, steal, kill, and destroy, that I don't see as being redemptive. That, I, I just can't see the justification for that. Now, some people may say, well, I need to know for myself whether or not that's bad, which is a weird justification, I think, for a Christian, right? That there's this idea that I need to taste the bad thing for myself in order for me to know whether it's right or wrong, okay? Because again, a Christian's relationship with God is based on trust. Do you believe God when he tells you this is bad and this is good? Does that make sense? If we're constantly telling God, You might be right, God, but I'll make the decision by myself. What does it reveal about your relationship with God? You actually don't trust him. If you can't trust him to tell you what's good and bad, do you really trust him with whether or not your sins are covered? Do you trust him with some of the bigger things? Those are good questions to ask. Okay. Um, And there's one more aspect of video gaming that I want to bring up because, again, we're talking about interactive media, right? Um, video games are becoming more popular, not less, because of mobile gaming, okay? The idea is that 10 years ago, the uh, digital hardware wasn't fast enough for you to play any decent kind of games handheld, but now we have on our phones tons and tons of games, right? Uh, The gaming industry on mobile is the biggest uh, gaming uh, source of revenue, right? So the idea is that there are games like this now called Roblox, okay? So Roblox is an interesting one. It's like Minecraft in that the experience is um, you, uh, it's an online virtual world and you can play thousands of mini games that are created by kids, okay? And this is uh, different from Minecraft in that Minecraft kind of has rules, okay? Uh, Roblox really has no rules in terms of what things look like and what things are shaped like and what things can do, okay? And if you've ever asked a kid to draw you something on a sheet of paper, they draw all sorts of crazy stuff. Does that make sense? So Roblox is a world where everything that a child can imagine, they can pretty much do, okay? And it's, it's fun for kids because, again, they get to be creative. So that's good. But here's the deal. And, and see if you can follow where this is going, okay? Roblox has a chat function. So you can communicate with other players. This chat function is ephemeral, meaning the conversations disappear over time. Now, this is a place where six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, and eight-year-olds are playing this game. That's the target market. What reason do six, seven, and eight-year-olds really have for typing ephemeral messages to each other? Can you think of a good reason that they would need that? Because it's not like this game can block out 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. Do you see where I'm going with this? Why do they need to have an ephemeral chat function in a game that's targeted towards 18, eight to 13-year-olds? Why is that necessary? It almost seems like the creator of the game is allowing a small window for adults to be in this world as well, to be able to communicate and chat. And I don't know about you, but I'm very deeply uncomfortable with the idea that eight-year-olds and 40-year-olds exist in the same playful world together and are chatting secret messages to each other that disappear that parents can't see. 
So there was a, a KidSpot article. So KidSpot magazine is a magazine in Australia, and they, uh, there was an article about a, uh, a dad who saw his son playing this game and noticed that there was this chat function. And I was like, whoa, who are you chatting with? And the son was like, I don't know, people from the internet. If you're a dad and you hear that your son is, I don't know, chatting with people from the internet, like, <laughs> red flag, give me the tablet, go to your room, and never come back out. Um, but the idea is that, okay, wait, what? You're doing what? So goes to sleep, dad gets on the tablet, pretends to be his eight-year-old son. Within 15 minutes, he gets proposition for sex. 15 minutes. So the idea is when you have interactive games, there are interactions that we don't necessarily want. But you can't stop that. And you can't prevent those things if the creator of the game wants to make this platform available to everybody. So those are the kinds of problems that come up when you have these kinds of new technologies. And people don't stop to think about whether or not these things are good. I'm not saying that the makers of the game are evil. But what I am saying is the makers of the game aren't thinking about whether or not it's good to do this. And that's the problem that we have as well. We don't think about whether or not media is good to consume, good to create. We just do it. And that's the problem. As Christians, we're not allowed to just do things. We must think through the implications of what we're doing, right? Viewing media passively is one of the worst things that we can do. As Christians, we have to learn how to view things actively, which brings me to our last one, which is social media. Now, I don't have a lot to say about this today because I'm actually in the midst of building an entire series based on social media, but I'll give you a couple things, okay, that hopefully will help you to think through um, social media itself. Social media is at the top in terms of an immersive experience, right? So with audio, we're talking about music. We're talking about the values you get from culture, the, um, catechet, the how you're, you're catechized in culture. With video, we're talking about stories. With interactive video, we're talking about you being a part of the story. In social, we're saying, basically, that you are the story, right? This is your opportunity to self-broadcast. And whether you're... Uh, Posting selfies, right, that are real, meaning you just woke up in the morning and you just post whatever it is that's a part of your life, or whether you're the kind of person that needs to take a thousand selfies and choose the best one, whether it's real or fake, you're crafting a story about yourself, okay? Um, the thing about social media is that it's the most distracting, okay? It's the most distracting because it doesn't need a lot of time. It can, you, can, you can post a selfie in five seconds and it's done. Um, and the little interactions that you have are distractions, basically, right? And the, the hard part about social media is, for a lot of us, it's become so, so much a part of our culture that we can't even distance ourselves from it, okay? Um, because you are the story, you can create the content, and you can view the content whenever you want, wherever you want. In fact, social media can only exist because we have devices on us that allow us to be constantly posting and constantly doing things. Okay? Social media existed before the smartphone, but it only exploded because now we have a device on us that can do all of these things. Right? Um, and it's the most distracting because, again, you don't need a lot of long, lengthy engagements. Some of us, if you want to play a video game, you have to sit down, you have to power on the console, you have to grab a drink, you have to sit there, you got to wear a headset, and you got to play, right? There's all the stuff you have to do. With social media, you just pop up on your phone, and you're there in less than five seconds, right? As our phones get faster and faster and faster, you can get into the things that you need to get into real fast, and you can pop out real fast. But those 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 20 minutes, those all add up throughout the day, right? And here's the thing. You're going to need to be held accountable for that time, right? Think about it. At the end of your life, when you stand in front of God, God's going to ask you, what did you do with the gift of time that I gave you? How did you spend your time? And if the only thing that you have to say is, well, I, you know, I, I accidentally spent a lot of time on my phone. Right? I mean, obviously, let's talk about Bible reading and prayer. Some of you guys have told the small, our, our, our teachers, like the reason why I don't pray and the reason why I don't, read is because I, I, I I'm so busy. No, you're not. You're not that busy. You just choose to do other things with your time. And if you think about it, what does being, what does social media add to your life? What does it add to your life? What's the tangible thing that it gives you? If you have a thousand Facebook friends, are you part of a Facebook community? Are those people surrounding you when you need them? that's not the benefit that you're getting. Really, social media gives us the ability to 
to tell stories, sure. And networks, and there are definitely redemptive parts of social media. But I think for most of us, if you really, really, truly comes down to it, the reason we're on social media is because everyone else is on social media. Right? Like, you don't love Instagram because Instagram is cool. You love Instagram because everyone else is on Instagram. You love Snapchat because everyone else is on Snapchat. If all your friends left Snapchat, would you still be Snapchatting? Sending stories to nobody? Of course not, right? You're, you're there because your friends are there. That's, that's the key. That's what's important. Now, they've done studies on this, lots and lots of studies now, and everyone reaches the same conclusions. Being on social media doesn't actually make anybody happier. It actually makes people more depressed. It's now, it's, it's so pervasive now that it's basically a fact, okay? Um, and the other thing, too, is not only are you the story, you are also the product, okay? Um, all of these companies, whether it's Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, whether it's Google, all these companies, do you pay them to use their services? When you open up Snapchat, do you, do you give them one cent per snap? Do you give them five cents per story? You don't pay them anything. So how are they making money? Because you're using their server space. Facebook doesn't delete any of your photos. Your photos are there forever. How are they paying for all of that? Well, it's because you're the product. Facebook is selling you to an advertiser, okay? And your advertiser knows more about you than you would like them to believe. Your phone carries an incredible amount of data, and it turns out that we all have very similar behaviors. When you hold your phone a certain way, your phone knows that you're holding it a certain way. There are accelerometers in here, there are sensors in here. The light sensor that actually turns off the screen when you put the phone to your face is also used to tell whether or not you're in darkness or light. Now, depending on the time, obviously they know whether you're daytime or nighttime. But all of these sensors combine to actually tell a pretty compelling story about how you feel. So all these companies, but particularly companies like Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, the ones that run on ad networks, okay, um, they know more details about you from the way that you hold your phone than you thought possible. Okay? And I know this because I was an app developer. We have, as an app developer, we have access to all of this data. We can tell how much your phone is tilted. We can tell by how fast you're scrolling whether or not you're actively engaged with the content that's coming up on your screen and how you're emotionally connected. If you're holding your phone up straight, okay, and you're flicking through at what they call a normal rate, it means that you are mildly engaged and you may be looking at the content because you're bored. So they're gonna send you as much exciting ads as possible. So advertisers want to target the way that you feel and so based on how you feel, they will send you ads that match those feelings. They can also tell when you're sad because sad people hold their phones a certain way and they scroll at a certain speed. Right? They know all this data about you. And if you notice, none of your news feeds on any social media platform is chronological. It's all based on an algorithm. And the question is, what is the algorithm? Nobody knows because these are all industry secrets. Right? So when, you're, when you open up your app and you go to Instagram, have you ever noticed that the people that you want to see from the most are the ones that are first? That's pretty easy because all they have to do is figure out who do you like, right? So when you click like, when you click the heart button or whatever, the ones that you like and comment on the most, those are always going to come to the top. You're never going to get chronologically the ones at the top. They do that because they want you to stay on their feed. And so you see the ones that you like, exciting, so you're scrolling through, right? And then you get kind of bored, so your scrolling starts to kind of slow down. So what they do is they'll send you an ad from a company that you like to get your interest back up. And they're like, oh, I like that. I like that photo. I like that ad. I like that video. That's funny, blah, blah, whatever. And then so you keep going. They want to keep you engaged as much as possible. And what's interesting is that's how they pay advertisers. The more that, that's how the advertisers pay, actually. So the more engaged they can get you, the advertisers are going to pay more. So the social media companies are all trying to get you to be in their app, scrolling through the newsfeed as much as possible, right? What are the implications of this? The implications of this is basically is there's no such thing as a short interaction anymore, right? We get distracted. So a two-minute check of your phone, right? Like right now, I have a bunch of, let's turn on, I have a bunch of notifications, right? So the idea is, oh, what are the notifications? I meant to open my phone to call my mom, but I see 15 notifications. So guess what? I forget calling my mom, and I go through all my notifications. How many of you guys got in trouble because you didn't call your mom on time? 
or you didn't communicate with your mom on time, or you didn't say something to your mom or your dad on time because you got caught going through these distractions. Same thing with homework. How many of us meant to start our homework at 8 o'clock but ended up starting at 12 midnight because we, were, we got caught up in notifications and blah, blah, and all this stuff, right? And some of you guys are type A, right, where, where you have to clear the notifications, right? Like, oh, I have to go through all my stories because I want to clear the notification. I don't like that little, you know, the, the number thing that's by the, you know, the app or whatever. You can go into general settings and turn off notifications. You know that, right? Just, just turn off, okay? Some of you guys will spend 15 minutes at the end of each day going through all of your Snapchat stories just so it could be reset for the next day. But you won't pick up your Bible and read it for five minutes. Do you see how the interactive video game thing is you rewarded for your behavior, same behavior over and over and over again? Social media people know the same thing. You get rewarded for certain behaviors. And so every single night, when you go to bed satisfied that you've seen every story, that's a reward that you get, and the social media companies know that. How many of us are satisfied, though, by God's word? How many of us are satisfied when we pray? If I were to walk through your Instagram story, would I see somebody who is sold out for God, or would I see somebody who is sold out for themselves? Think about what you're broadcasting. You are the story. What is your story? It's now there, out in the open, for everyone to see. And if I investigate your story, is Jesus there? Is God there? Is there anything of value? Or is your story all about you? Philippians 3, 8 through 11 says this. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And a great way to kind of summarize this and explain, Jaquel Crow in the in the book, This Changes Everything, says this. Sure, there are mo beautiful moments when Jesus is supremely valuable to me, but then there are moments when he isn't. Those are the times I'm distracted from the treasure by trinkets and trifles. I'm too busy obsessing over how I look or addictively checking my phone or getting angry about a lost baseball game, I'm, and I'm living like Jesus is second best. And those are the times I most desperately need this reminder. Christ is my treasure. He's my reward, my joy, my everything, and as his follower, my task is to live like it. I love her way of summarizing Philippians 3, 8 through 11. This idea that Christ is my reward, he's my treasure, he's my joy, my everything. If your social media story does not convey that, ask yourself if Christ is actually your everything. If the thing that you broadcast to everyone else is everything but Jesus, he's not your everything. He's not your joy. And if he's not your everything and he's not your joy, your relationship with God is broken. But it doesn't end there. The truth is, God's grace is sufficient even when we have been deficient. If your social media life, if your life up until this point has been one of rejecting God, God has an open invitation for you. The gospel is not for those who are perfect. The gospel is not for those who are successful in everything they do. The gospel is for those of us who are broken. For those of us who have yet to make Christ our treasure, the gospel is an invitation for us to make him our treasure. And I'll say this too, just one practical thing. If you find that your social media, or, or think of this picture, okay? You're in the middle, God's on this side, and your heart is on this side. And when I say your heart, I really mean that evil, wicked thing that lives inside of you, okay? Because that's who we are. We are sinful beings. So your evil heart is here, you're here, and God is here. God's tugging on this way. He wants a relationship with you. Your evil heart is tugging this way because your evil heart wants what's best for you, okay? Your evil heart wants greed and lust and fame and all those things. Your evil heart's pointing this way. Think about the media you consume. Is the media that you consume helping your heart pull this way? Or is the media that you consume helping God pull this way? Does what you watch and what you listen to and the things that you say and do on social media, are they more about your heart getting and gaining evil, wicked things? Or are they more about bringing you closer to who Christ is? That's how we process through what's good for us, what's bad for us. And I'll say this. Practically speaking, 
on your social media accounts, if you're following people who are tugging this way, unfollow them. That's a challenge. You have to do that. If you're following people who are posting stuff that's dirty, nasty, gross, selfish, greedy, evil, wicked, sinful, unfollow them. Do not look at those things. And instead, follow people and organizations that offer you value on God's side, that give you virtue, that promote love, patience, goodness, faithfulness. That's the way we need to think about this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for challenging us about these things. For many of us, we never think about our behavior because we've been trained in, a, in our culture just simply to receive, not to think about what we're getting. But God, the, the truth is, if we were to go to a restaurant and they were to just give us a mystery meal, we would open that and we would wonder if what's in it is actually good for us. We don't do that with media. We just take it in without thinking whether or not this is good for us. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be discerning, that you would help us to be more careful about the things that we're ingesting, the things that we're taking into our hearts and into our souls. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to recognize that if our lives aren't marked by following Jesus, if we're ashamed of the gospel, I pray, Lord, that we would take up your free invitation to believe, to be washed clean. I pray that we would repent and to come to you knowing that you are willing to save us, to redeem us, to forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray.